الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا اما بعد فقد قال الله عز وجل شهر رمضان الذي انزل فيه القران هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان وقال الله عز وجل يا ايها الذين امنوا كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من صام رمضان ايمانا واحتسابا غفر له ما تقدم من ذنبه ومن قام رمضان ايمانا واحتسابا غفر له ما تقدم من ذنبه او كما قال عليه الصلاه والسلام رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا انك انت العليم الحكيم respected brothers and elders mothers and sisters listening at home looking at the scenes and the images and hearing the conflicts that are happening around us it should bring us all to a conclusion any person who looks into it he'll come to a conclusion and he'll come to a decision of where he stands and what he has to do today we have the example of syria in front of us just yesterday we had example of egypt whether it be libya whether it be iraq whether it be afghan before that we had burma and then if we want to go carry on we can carry on going at the times when it was a times of the muslims in bosnia if we want to carry on we can carry on many years but unfortunately at the moment it's going it's becoming a bit faster it's becoming a bit a bit more regular now when one looks into it we seem to think why is it us why is it muslims being oppressed everywhere wherever we go and we come to conclusions some people come to conclusions which have no basis at all and their conclusion will be until we don't have the sharia law implemented in buckingham palace or unless it's not implemented where in the parliament there's no way forward some people will come to a conclusion that until a khalif until a state does not come which is run by a khalif until then there is no way forward that's conclusions that some brothers will come out with and we hear it sometimes and we hear them bawling as well sometimes we hear them shouting all over the place sometimes but does anybody realize do we ever think that when we see these scenes and when we see things which are happening when we hear things which are happening around the world do we come to realize that whatever happens upon our muslim brothers all around the world don't put it beyond allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may he protect us but don't put it beyond him that those consequences could not be on our doorstep tomorrow the world remember from beginning of time to till today every time something has happened you will see if it happens somewhere whatever goes around comes around things keep on changing that's why it's called dunya dunya is round things will keep on going round situations will carry on changing they'll never they'll never be the same always have we started thinking that because we're in a place where there's peace at the moment and because we seem to think that fine we've got security our peace will last forever so therefore we can enjoy the luxuries of life however we want my brothers look into history the muslims in bosnia 
They had never imagined. They had never even dreamed that such things would happen to them. Look at Burma. Muslims have never dreamed. The way they were living was the way that they thought that there is completely nothing we can, which can touch us. In within days, they were stripped from their clothes and they were left to go outside. Even if they wanted to go with their clothes, the clothes were taken off them to, yet to the extent that some, when it came to the time of Bosnia, some Muslim brothers and sisters, they had to leave their underwear, their chaddis, whatever they had to leave, they had to leave it there and go. This way they, whatever they had, they were stripped of it and they had to go. And the same people who we rely upon, fine. Alhamdulillah, they are showing us very good. They are showing a very good character to us. They are given us a safe place to stay. They may be given us, being non-Muslim, they are still giving us the opportunity to carry out our acts of religion. But you know the same hearts? The same hearts which are giving us this peace today, Allah can change those hearts anytime, remember. Just remember this. The one who is making them a means of giving, them us, giving us peace today, that same being, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may Allah protect us. He can give them the same, he can, these, you know sometimes we think, oh yeah, this small party, BMP, what was BMP going to do? Vote? Nothing. What can they do? They can do nothing. Yeah, some ADL just ganging up around here and there. What are they going to do? The most they can do is cause a bit of hoo-ha here and there and they're gone. That's, that's our imagination. That's our thinking. But you know when they change, when their intentions change, you will see votes and you will see votes going a different way. And when they go the different way, my brothers, today, none of us are willing. Inside our hearts, look closely, look at the whole ummah today. Let me tell you, you can go around and you can give a card, you can vote. Give a vote to the whole ummah and put it out. Who wants Sharia law? Who would go to a country which is underneath the Sharia law? Go and put it out. The first question that they will ask, hijab. Our ummah will ask, hijab. People will ask, will I have to keep the beard? People will ask, will I have to certain or abide by these strict conditions? And then we can go around asking Allah for Sharia. He's not going to give it to us. It's never going to come. It never will come. Do you know what? The, do you know when it will come? Let me tell you, brothers, when it will come. It will come at a time if we don't will for it. If we don't will to go according to Allah's laws, living in lands, living in a land where people are giving us peace, where people are letting us practice our religion. If we do not practice our religion in such kind of places, then let me tell you when Sharia law will come. Sharia law will come. If we don't do it at now, Sharia law will come when Allah will bring consequences upon the Ummah to such an extent that they will say, Allah, now we wish Sharia law because it is better than what is happening to us now. When a person wants to make a change, that's when Allah makes a change. Inna Allah la yughayru ma biqawmin hatta yughayru ma bi anfusihim. Never will come a time that we don't have intentions for something, Allah will bring it onto us and we'll have it easy as, easy as we want it, as we would love to have it. The state of the Ummah doesn't affect us today. When somebody tells us, or when we hear that our own brothers, they've gone to the extent of becoming pimps. It's reality, nothing to hide. Yes, it is not our duty as a masjid to go around in Jummah khutbahs and if we're told, make sure you do a bayan on this, that's it, we have to do a bayan on it. No, it's not our responsibility. But what does that mean? Does that mean, yeah, that's them. Uh, doesn't it hurt us? If it doesn't hurt us, if it doesn't bring sorrow over us, that our own Muslim brothers have gone to such an extent. Somebody rings today. He says, I've given my wife a divorce, brother Ramzan. Why? I was intoxicated. I was intoxicated. Ask your wife what you said. He said, I don't know what I said, nor does my wife know what she said. <coughs> and then, more unfortunate on top. That's one thing which is sorrowful, which we should be hurt about, but more hurtful. I said to him, go to your local masjid. I gave him somebody's name as well. I said, go there. He'll be able to help you out. There's someone there. I knew his local masjid. He said, no. I can't trust the people who are, who I can't trust the people over there. I can't trust them. I said, why not? He says they've got a bad habit. When anything happens, they put it up for, for the community very fast. This is the state of the leaders and this is the state of the ummah today. Does it not hurt us? 
If that sorrow and that heart, that hurt does not come for the brother inside our hearts and my brothers, what effect will we have? Forget the whole empire, forget the whole global world, forget everything put together. My brothers, you know this heart, this heart, it's a small kingdom in with itself. Just this heart, it's a kingdom in itself. If we cannot rule this heart, if we cannot keep this heart out of corruption, how are we going to make it affect anywhere else? Impossible. It's not possible. That is why the, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the Quran to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where was it being revealed? Where did Jibreel put his hand? He says, Iqra, and he pressed on the heart. From the heart came the knowledge, and from the heart, this Islam spread. Throughout the whole world. And sometimes we think, we look at something, whether it be Dawul Ulums, whether it be the work of Jama'ah, whatever work we look at, we think that, oh yeah, whatever has happened up to today, is because of the thing that we are doing. My brothers, no. You know those companions, the Prophet Sallallahu and the companions, and the people who came before, before us, the prize predecessors? It was their heart. They had Sharia in within their life. That's what it was that used to spread their effects. If it was us, if it was us, then how come the same effects are not there today? Why are those effects not there today? The heart is something, Imam Ghazali Rahmatullah says, the heart is something which is so precious and it needs a defense. It needs a defense. It needs a wall around it. To save yourself from all sorts of corruptions and fitnas that are going to come towards it. There's no way out. Somebody can think, oh, I just hope uh, this world was so such a nice place without any fitness. It's not going to happen. He has to live. He has to live on the face of the earth. You can go anywhere. Just go into Tesco and just line up. You will see somebody there with a miniscape. What are you going to do? You're not going to line up. Don't line up then. Go and wait outside. There's no, what are you going to do? You have to. You have to line up. But Allah Azza wa Jal, he doesn't want us to put ourselves in such a position where there's no way out. All he wants is let the fitness be around you. Let all the corruption be around you. Let everything be around you. At least keep your heart safe from the corruption. That's what he wants from us. He doesn't want anything else. But yet even in this, even in a small test like this, look at our hearts. Two brothers. In Nanitan, their father passed away. The father passes away today, and his janazah, not today, I mean today, but the day his father passes away, the janazah and is about to take place. Now one son, one brother goes to his brother, the brother that he thought was always his elder brother. With the most respect, he used to treat his own brother, own blood brother. He says, I would like to go into the garden so I can take my bike out. He needed, he needed some assistance. He needed to go and get something. He thought it would be faster because there was a lot of things going on at the time to prepare for the janazah. He thought if I got onto the motorbike, I'd be able to get to the destination faster. So he says to his brother, can I have the keys for the house? I need to get to the garden. I need to take out the thing, the, my bike from the garage. And as soon as I take it out, then I can give you the keys back. This brother for years, this brother for years who had never fought, he had always respected and kept as his own brother, own blood. His brother could never do. He says no. From today, until the paperwork is not sorted out, I cannot give you the keys. I cannot give you the keys. This is the state. And this, this is not just one incident. My brothers, look around everywhere. You can look into our own and you can look an outside. You can look everywhere. The state is, and this is reality. This is the state. But yet, we wish that everything to change around the world. 70,000 have gone in Syria, my brothers. 70,000 have gone. Whether it be in conflict, whether it be, whether it be shahada, whether it be in wounds, 70,000. And numbers will increase, nobody knows. But let's hope and make that dua that Allah, <laughs> let that be that the bloodshed that is happening, that bloodshed does not come to us also. And if we don't correct our ways, my brothers, believe me, if we don't correct our ways and we cannot rule this small heart of ours and we cannot even bring effects onto ourselves and we cannot send these effects out to other people, then never wish for a change because this change cannot happen. It's just dreams. It's just things that we're thinking about that will never happen. And this is the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gives us this blessed month of Ramadan. A mercy on us, a mercy. Why? Because 11 months, your hearts were corrupt. Corrupt as anything. All the pollution and the fitna of the dunya has gone in there. 
And when we look for 11 months, we've been worshipping. Yes, we've been worshipping. We've been carrying out Rosa, we've been carrying out Salahs. We've been carrying out other types of worship that would be Zakah. But remember, all of these other worships which we, we've been carrying out, these worships are worships which are done by actions. You have to do them. You have to carry out these actions. In Ramadan, Allah gives us one action, which is fasting, don't do anything. But what? Refrain, stay away. So all 11 months, carry on doing. And one month, don't do. You know when you go to a doctor, you go to Hakim, and you say to him, sugar, sugar problem. He says, fine. Insulin, injection, sugar, candrel, whatever you have to do. Then you say to him, but yeah, can I eat Ambala from tomorrow? Can I have, bring a box of, of Salwa, you know? He's going to say, no. He said, you can't. Why not? It's still going to make no effect. Whatever you do, whatever medication you're taking at the moment, it'll have no effect at all. The same way 11 months Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us to do. One month He told us don't do to balance everything and put the, put the records right. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kutiba alaykum as I have made rosas. I have made these fasts obligatory upon you. Why? So that, la'allakum tattaqoon. So that you can gain the taqwa and the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in within you. Now how will this taqwa come? How will it come? Everything is around us. We know. We know the situation that we're in. Nobody needs to explain any more, any more further. We know our own situation. How will we build that brick? How will we build that wall? How will we build that defense around our hearts? The heart and a human has two qualities in within him. One quality which is known that the animals have, okay? Let's call it as the animalistic, the, the sefats and the qualities that the animals have in within themselves. And one is jabarut, the angelic qualities, the angelic qualities that a person has. What's the difference between them? Let me give you an example. A hayawan, an animal, you can eat, 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 carry on eating. Give it how much you want to carry on eating, it doesn't matter. Until it has no space at all, you'll carry on eating. It's got no limits, no stop to it. An animal, if it wants to fulfill its desires anywhere, no limits. It will go and fulfill its desires anywhere, whatsoever. Animal is first, it'll carry on drinking. Human has the same qualities, we have the same qualities. But if we don't control them, if we don't control them, the angels control them. How do the angels control them? They don't eat. They don't eat. But what do they do? They become sakhi. They bring food for the whole entire humanity to eat. Humans, angels don't drink, but they bring the water down for us to drink. Angels don't need to sleep, but they make the atmosphere, a peaceful atmosphere for us to sleep in. So they have qualities and animals have qualities, we're in between. We have both type of qualities. It's up to us, it's up to us to bring them in control and that's why this Rosa is there to keep them in control. Let me give you a very good example. Say for instance we're sitting in a restaurant, Sahara Grill, we're sitting in Sahara Grill and we're having our nice meal, we're enjoying it and we see somebody else, whether it be Muslim or non-Muslim come, they come into the restaurant and you know, we're enjoying it and we've got a nice, you know, we've got a mango lassi there as well. Just one thing before I carry on. You know, sometimes we have one very bad habit. Me and everybody, when I say we, it means everybody, everybody is the same ship. Everybody is the same. We have a very bad habit. When we leave these places of eating, we think, you know, forget it, let's walk, let's go. There's food left in there. There's plenty of food left, plenty. And we walk off. And if somebody was to tell us, you know, let's get it packed, any who pack karakare, who should get that packed? Imagine what he's going to think of me, cheapskate. Cheapskate coming and packing up the food and taking it with him. But my brothers, there have been times, believe me, there's, there's one brother, he says he came on a business trip. He came on a business trip from an African country, he came here, and his place where he was living in a village got caught up in an earthquake. He says that when he came here as a business trip, when he went back, the same family, 
the same children that he had left there in luxury, that same family of his was standing in the queues of charity taking these rice bags. Allah can change anything anytime, like the way I said before. Do not take anything for granted. In India, when the earthquake struck, one billionaire, he had chains of jewelry shop. Jewelry shop chains. But where he was holding most of his stock went down all the way in. Now debts and everything that he could cover, he could not cover anything. Everything was gone. The debts that he had took over what they had, the debt people took over his property, whatever he had, there he was. A person who is living in a multi-millionaire mansion, multi-million mansion, there he is on the road. Do not ever take anything for granted. Allah can change situations anytime. Do not waste. Allah Azza wa Jal does not like, La yuhibbul musrifin, doesn't like people who waste. So going back, say we were drinking that lassi now, and a person comes in. And we can see, we can see that he is so thirsty, but he's got no money. Okay, fine, he's got no money. Why has he got no money? Because he drinks all day long. He's, he's got a beer belly. You can tell he's got a beer belly. He's sleeping on the roads, and that's why he's got a beer belly, and he uses all the money that he gets towards his beer. So he's got no accommodation, he's got nothing. That's why he's a beggar on the road, and that's why he's come here, and that's why he takes your mango lassi off you. And he takes a sip. He takes a sip quick as possible. And he's smelling, and you can smell the smell that comes out of him as well. But do you know something? When he takes that sip, if on our faces and in our heart, we seem to feel, ah, oh, this guy, what's it done? Anim the animal quality is above. The animal quality that we have has got a more of a glow, is, is, it's taking over our angelic quality. And if we feel that, oh, he was thirsty, no matter what situation he was, he was thirsty, he drank it, okay, it doesn't matter, and we have a smile on our face, this means that our angelic quality is above our anim the animalistic quality. So we have to bring these qualities into control. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us this month. But yet, unfortunately, you know, when we think about fast, when we think about psalm, what we think, it's only about stopping from eating and drinking and that's it. As long as we've done that, our psalm is done, it's fine. Yes, the fine, the, the psalm is done. Nobody say, nobody's gonna say, no mufti is gonna say your psalm, your rosa is not done. Because that's what's in front of him. You, you didn't eat. Nor did you have any sort of connection with your wife. Nor did you drink. It's fine. Your rosa is done. But does that mean that you've achieved exactly everything what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted you to achieve in this fast? Does this mean that the spirituality that a person who uses his fast or who stays in his fast in the right manner, do you think you're going to be exempt on the level as him? No, it's not possible. It's not going to be possible. In the roses before the songs before, it's due to the mercy of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we have been given permission to talk, right? It's because due to his mercy. As an ummah, Allah had mercy on us and he told us we're allowed to talk. But remember the, the, the rosas that the people used to keep before, the songs that the nations used to keep before, they were not allowed to talk. What did Mayu alayhi salatu wasalam say? Lan ukallim al yawma in siya. She said, I'm fasting. I will not talk. Zakaria alayhi salatu wasalam, when he was told for glad tidings that you will get a son, you will keep three days rosa, three days fast. Fast means no eating, no eating. He was not allowed to talk also. He was not allowed to talk also. So when we've been given permission to, to talk, what does this mean? Does this mean that, come on, yes, we see the youngsters gossiping even before iftar time. You know, sometimes my brothers is very sorrowful. We're talking about such things, they've got nothing to do with us, they'll never benefit us. They'll never benefit us in this world, nor the hereafter. And yet in Ramadan, we can do that as well. We use our time and we utilize our time doing other things. Talking about things, la ya'ani, you've got no base at all. Anything which does not give us any benefit in this world, in the hereafter, is non-beneficial. Non-beneficial. And in the, at the time we're fasting, at the time we're going to break a rosa, my brothers, this, this, it doesn't make, it doesn't come into, it doesn't even come to equation. We shouldn't be doing it at all. I know, we've been told, no talking. We'll talk about everything. No limit at all. If we're going to carry on like that, then these qualities that we have in within the elements, this, the animal qualities that we have, they'll always stay dominant. They're never going to go down. Second thing we've been told. Do not waste time. The second thing, the second thing that we've been told is utilize the time in the right manner in what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to do. And the th second thing is 
third thing is do not eat. Do not eat means when you, when you eat, you can eat, but eat to a, eat to an extent. You know, what happens is, unfortunately our sisters, they prepare so much in the kitchen, so much in the kitchen, and they're always preparing. Why? Why are they preparing? But it's not always their fault. It's not always their fault. It's our fault as well sometimes. You know why? Because we demand it. We want it. They do it because we're the husband. So they'll do it because they feel it as a responsibility. But is it not our responsibility also as well to sit down and say, look, don't worry about my food. Don't worry about too much. The same way we all have to build that connection with Allah. You're also a servant. She's not our bandi, right? She's not our slave. She's the slave of Allah. She's not our slave. She's there for our khidmah, but she's not our slave. She's the slave of Allah. The same way we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, does she not have a right to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also? Could we not just go home and say, look, it's enough what you've done. Just make it to the minimum. It's fine. I'll suffice on whatever I have. And then spend the rest of your time while I'll be building my connection with Allah. While I'll be making my du'as there, you make your du'as. Imagine a house with a husband and the wife. Both of them are there in the morning at the Hajjud time, at Sahadi time. And we're both making du'a. The light in that house and the light in another house is not the same. It's not possible. But we seem to think, you know, there's a hadith where it says, Inna fi suhuri baraka. Inside Sahadi there is a blessing. So that's why I start after Tarawi, inshallah, mashallah, all the way till, all the way till carry on. First we'll start slowly, 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 then maybe 10, 15 minutes of rest, 20 minutes of rest, wake up again, back again to Sahri again, all the way till Fajr beginning time. This is reality. This is what happens. This hadith where Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, in the Sahri there is a barakah. What kind of Sahri is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa talking about? Sahaba Sahri was kajur, dates, and a bit of milk, and Sahri is finished. The only reason why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said this, that do sehri was, that the Christians and the Jews, they used to have a thinking. That why do sehri? Let's keep a proper fast. If you want to keep a fast, keep a proper fast. 24 hour one. The Prophet Sallallahu was trying to explain that no, that's not the way it works. Do a bit of sehri as well, eat a bit also. This is complete, you know, there's, I heard there was one buddy who was telling me that in my family what happens is that there's three or four, they put the sisters, two of them maybe, and two sister-in-laws, so four in total, one in Leicester, one in Birmingham, one in Dewsbury, so they have dawats. So they have a dawat in every place at least once in Ramadan. Fine, mashallah, very good, have a dawat. But why? Why do they have the dawats? There's a competition of who's got the most things prepared. So at the moment, somebody's sister has prepared 24 things. She wants to prepare 24 things, 15 things before Ramadan, and 9 she will carry out in Ramadan. Competition, who's going to prepare the most? What will be, what will be the outcome of these rules, as my brothers? How is it going to build that wall of taqwa? How is it going to keep us away? How is it going to keep us away from those animalistic, those kind of habits which animals have without any control? How is it going to bring our ones into control? It's something we have to ponder about. Something that we have to work upon. I make an intention that when it comes to iftar time, no matter what, my brother's out of 24 hours at iftar time, 10 minutes dua, 5 minutes dua, it can do no damage to us at all. What damage is going to do? It's got benefit after benefit. Every dua Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not give guarantee for. Either if that dua is accepted or it's not accepted, there's no guarantee. If it is accepted, it's accepted. If it is not accepted, Allah will give it maybe in the future. If Allah does not give it in the future, then Allah on the day of judgment will say, Banda, you made, oh my slave servant, you made this dua. Here, I did not accept it in the world. Take it now. But when it comes to the dua or iftar, Allah, there's no if some buts. Allah gives us no if some. He says, I surely, definitely will accept your du'as when you make them at the time of iftar. There's no ifs and buts. And at the time of the hajjud, Allah is there coming down. Allah is coming down. He's descending down. He's coming down to the skies. Hal min mustaghfirin fa astaghfirullah. Any of you is there to repent to me? Any of you are there to repent to me? Hal min taibin fa atubu ilayh. Anybody there to ask repentance for me so I can turn towards them? We're sleeping. Or we're eating. And dua is something. Dua is something. My brothers, nobody can teach us. If we've got that in our minds, that somebody can teach us dua, fine. They can keep, teach us the duas which have been made. But the inside duas which are in within the heart, nobody can teach us. We have to teach ourselves. We have to teach ourselves. Sometimes we think, you know, many things, not only one thing, many aspects we think. That when scholars say something to us, we think, yeah, you know, to that, you know, it's very strict, very harsh on certain issues, very harsh. For himself, he should keep the taqwa wara call. For the taqwa, the taqwa call, the call of taqwa, he should keep for himself. For everybody else, he should give out the lenient one. 
So if he keeps the taqwa call for himself, if he keeps the safeguard in call for himself, he keeps the opinion which is the most best for himself, and he doesn't tell us what the best opinion is, then how are we going to know what's the best? How are we going to know? We should appreciate he's telling us the best out of a lot. You know, sometimes I'm telling you, you know, shaitan, he works. He works in such a way, amazing. You know, like the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has angels as his army, shaitan, he has a very, very big army also. Either whether it be within the jinns or either be within the humans. Sometimes he uses the humans as his aid also. So he tries to tempt us and the bigger the shaitan, the bigger the person, the bigger pious the person, the more taqwa the person has, the more bigger the shaitan also. Inside a riwayah of Tirmizi it comes that every person has a shaitan with him. It's a sahih riwayah. Every person has their own shaitan with him. And they work directly from Iblis. They take all their mashwaras from Iblis. They work the same way as the angels work also. It's just that Allah is the supreme there. Nobody can, nobody can test. But he tries, he tries his utmost best. He tries his utmost best to do whatever he can. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us, you know, sometimes we have to learn who our enemy is. You know, if you go to a martial arts class, okay, you go to learn how to fight, okay, the first thing they're going to teach you, what's the first thing they're going to teach you? They'll teach you the most moves they'll teach you, say you're right in front, okay, you're just opposite him. The first, all the moves that they will teach you, the moves will be when you know your enemy. Whether they're going to block like this, whether they're going to block like that, whatever they're going to teach you, okay? The first thing is, they will teach you how to fight your enemy or defend from your enemy when? When he's in front of you. And how many moves do they have for you to carry out when a person is going to attack you from a place where you don't know? A very few, maybe a few from the back. But they always give you that tactic, they always show you that if he's at the back, try to bring him in front, try to bring him in front. There's always ways to bring him in front. So we know our enemy like this, when we go, to, we, if we were to have a bit of knowledge, everybody knows. If you know the enemy, you're more safe. If you don't know the enemy, you're in more danger. Allah Azza wa Jal explains this enemy of ours to us, of Iblis. What sort of an enemy is he? Do you know what kind of an enemy he is? In the narrations it comes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he created this Adam, he tried to keep, he made the structure of Adam, and he said to all the angels that come and have a view, shaitan came, Iblis came, and the first thing he tried to go towards was the heart. Allah stopped him right there and then said, Oh Iblis, this human, I have not given life to him yet. If I let you go towards that heart and put any effect inside that heart, that heart will have an effect, and that effect in the heart will carry on till the day of judgment. All of Adam Adam's awlad and all of Adam's child will have this effect inside him till the day of judgment. Therefore, I do not wish to give you permission to gain this heart. I will leave it, I will leave it free. I will leave it free purely for myself, for my worship. But if this banda and this servant of mine decides that he wants you inside his heart after I've given him this life, that's up to him. That's up to him if he wants to. Look at how merciful Allah is. Look how much he has prepared us. Look how much he has saved us from such a, such a, such an enemy of ours. What does he say? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذْ يَمْكُرُوا بِكَ الَّذِينَ كَفُرُوا لِيُثْبِتُوكَ أَوْ يَقْتُلُوكَ أَوْ يُخْرِجُوكَ Do you remember, O Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there was a time when these people, these enemies of yours, they made a plan against you. A meeting was taking place in Darul Nadwa. Abu Jahl and his people. Abu Jahl and his people were sitting there. Behind closed doors, very discreet. And an old man comes in. Nobody knows. Nobody even realizes the old man has come in. Forget about knowing, he starts voicing his opinion. Still nobody knows. This is, this is how shaitan is. And then, one voice is an opinion. Let's prison him. Shaitan says no. Iblis says no. Well, he's acting as an old man there, in the meeting, as a wise man, as a person who can give some advice. He says, no, by imprisoning him, this deen will go forward. Don't imprison him. So, okay, fine. Let's kick him out of our land. Let's remove him from our land. Shaitan says, no, if you remove him from the land, if you remove him from here, he will go to another tribe. He will go somewhere else. Those people will start following him. New Muslims will, there will be new Muslims over there. Why? Why let them tell him to leave? Third opinions come from Abu Jahl himself. Abu Jahl says, let's kill him. But in such a manner, in such a manner, 
that out of the 60 tribes that we have, there's only one tribe that's going to take his side, which is Banu Hashim, his own tribe. All the other 59, let's get the youngsters, one youngster from every tribe to strike on him. And when every, when every tribe, every youngster of a tribe strikes on him, are they going to fight with 59? One tribe is going to fight with 59? It's not possible. So this view take, take, goes forward. Iblis says, yes, yeah, mashallah, this is a very good view. He was the one who put the view in him anyway. Shaitan is the one who puts the views in him anyway. So he is the one who put the view in him anyway. When he gives the view, he says, oh yeah, yeah, very good. You've done very good. Very good. But what I said is, you know, until the day of judgment, this battle between angels and shaitan will carry on happening. And it will happen till the day when Dajjal comes. And Dajjal will be, Dajjal will be that person who fights on the side of shaitan with material. He'll fight with all the instruments that are out there. He'll fight with all the technology that, has, that is out there. And the whole reason what I'm trying to explain to this, uh, trying to bring you towards this subject is, it's the spirit of the heart. If the heart is fine, Isa alayhi salatu was salam, he had that spiritual healing inside him, he had those spiritual qualities inside him, and those abilities, spirituality will fight with shaitan, with technology, and spirituality will come out on top. So this is the reason. Why I say that sometimes when scholars, they tell us something, they say something to us, we think, oh yeah, he's backdated. Maybe he doesn't understand much. He doesn't change with the times. Now we have to change with the times. I'm not saying we don't have to change the times. Yeah, we do have to change. But what kind of change? What kind of change? There's limits in changing and these scholars know the limits. And they wish that we do not touch those limits because they know if we touch those limits, we'll fall into those. They know if we go towards that fitna, we'll fall into that fitna. They stop us from the beginning. We should, we should be happy with these kind of scholars that stop us from the beginning. That they do, do not wish that my Muslim brother even goes towards it where he will fall into it. We can open up to everybody and give them all sorts of fatwas that we want. And then the caution that comes with it also, who's going to save them from that? Till today, I've got many examples. We can say all day long, until we don't get into the media, until we don't get into there, we will not make an effect. Until we don't get into the media, we will not make an effect. It will not make an effect anywhere else. My brothers, remember one thing. You can go and you can run the whole world's media until that heart and that spirit is not there. There's no effect at all. That heart needs to be rectified. That heart needs to be cleaned. And like the way I said, for every person there's a shaitan. You know, sometimes whether it be the mufti sahab, the mufti sahab as well, you know, shaitan will explain to him, you know, the fatwa is, if a lady, if lady phones you, you can pick it up, mashallah, you can pick it up. Why not? Why not? You can pick it up. Why? She needs help. Islamic question. Pick it up. Why not pick it up? Fine. You see, mufti sahab picks up the phone. Salaam alaikum. The first time is as short as possible. Short as possible. The second time the call comes, another masla, yeah, yeah. The third time another masla, the fourth time another masla, whenever there's any problem now, it's the same Mufti Sahib always on the phone. Always the same Mufti Sahib on the phone, mashallah. And then, and then, Allah knows best. So where, where every person has his taqwa, the same type of shaitan is there also. Just remember that. A normal person, Shaitan doesn't need, he doesn't need to be there himself. This meeting, it was regarding the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it was so important, Iblis comes himself. But when it comes to normal people, he'd send the small ones. And whether there's an alim or a sheikh or whatever, he'll send the bigger one. There's flexibility. Use your flexibility. That's how he explains. Use the flexibility. And then after a few months, the sister's not ringing because she's got no maslas. Mufti sahab will ring. Salaam Yes. Ringing for the sake just to ask him, is everything okay? I haven't heard for a long time, but just asking everything is fine. Oh. That's why when these scholars give us, and these muttaqi, these muttaqi muftis, the ones that have taqwa in them, these ulamas with taqwa, when they give us those fatwas of taqwa, respect them, my brothers, respect them. It's very hard to find such scholars nowadays. I still know, and I can give you an example. Of some scholars, they will only talk to a woman if it is emergency. Emergency, otherwise they will not talk. If they have to, they will call. They will call the lady to the house and they will have their wife there sitting in one room and that scholar will sit in another room. So going back to the, going back to the point regarding dua. My brothers, dua we teach ourselves. 
I'm not going into the debate whether we should do dua after namaz, after first, whether it's permissible, whether it's no way it should do, it has to be done. Let's leave everything to our side. But one reason that we give sometimes, if the, if the dua is done loud, if it is done loud, if it is done loud, we will learn the dua also. It will benefit us, we will learn the dua. My brothers, in within the UK, how many years has this dua been done loud? In how many masjids around the world? After all of these years, we still have not learned how to make dua? We still not make, we still not learn how to make dua? What does this mean? I don't need to explain to anybody, what does this mean? This means that a person can only learn how to make dua when he, when he wishes himself to learn how to make dua. Until then he can't learn how to make dua. And make dua. And when we make dua, if we feel that Allah, we are so, we are so, we are big criminals in front of you. If we feel that, yeah, putting our hands out in front of Allah is a shame also. Put our child also. If we have children at home, bring it into them also. Put them there. Lift those hands. If we can't lift those hands, lift those, actually think to ourselves, just think about one na'mah, just think about one, this iman quality, this quality of iman that Allah has given us, think of it. That is there anything better that Allah could have given us than this iman? This should, this should automatically take our hands out in front of Allah to ask. And make dua Allah, if you are not going to accept my dua because I'm such a criminal. Allah, my son is sitting here, my daughter is sitting here, my innocent daughter is sitting here, my innocent small son is sitting here. Allah, if you're not going to, if you're not saying, if you're not going to reply to my duas, then Allah, at least on their arm, you accept me. Learn how to make these duas. I don't want to take too much time. And one last thing, just one last thing, a humble request, very humble request. Remember, all the grudges that we have in between. All the enmity that we have in between. Everything that in Ramadan, it should be clean. Clean as anything. You take it out. Forget it. Leave it. Why? Such a person can make dua. All Ramadan, he can make dua. Even till the extent that he will be making dua on Laylatul Qadr, Allah says, I will not accept. It's not accepted. You got grudge in your heart for your Muslim brother. You got grudge in your heart for your Muslim sister. Take it out. Until then, your du'as are not accepted. Whether it be Laylatul Qadr as well, the most powerful night, it's not accepted. So, bond those ties. Wherever we have a grudge, wherever there is something wrong, bond it. Whoever does bad with you, do good with them. I say this many times again. Look at here, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, look at his character. They have come to kill him. They've come to finish him. They've come to take his life. They've come to take his life. What does he do? He puts Ali radiallahu an on his bed and he tells Abu Bakr radiallahu to come with him. And what is he doing? What is he doing? These enemies are coming to kill. He's preparing to give them the amanah back what they've given him to keep. Look at the character, my brothers. Just look at it. From one incident we learn so much things. From this incident we can learn so much. I don't have the time. I'll just maybe another five minutes if I have. If we look just into this incident, our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is taking Ali radiallahu an and he's putting him on his bed. And then what is he doing? He's taking Abu Bakr radiallahu anh with him. Just in this incident, there's a, there's a clear, clear cut evidence that we have that there are people there who ball that Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, Ali radiallahu anh, they had so much enmity in within them. They had so much enmity in within them that they used to, they used to hate one another to the extent one person was the ruling party, one was the other party. My brothers, look what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi is indicating here. I have left Ali on my bed and I'm taking Abu Bakr with me. Both of my companions, they're both beloved to me and they both love one another also. We don't need to look into these things. When we see these different groups, whether it be the Qadian, you know, Qadian is so simple. I just, you know, inside, you know, it, whether it was right for them to do it or whether it was not right for them to do it, but they did it, okay? So, in, in India, there was a village. They decided, let's explain to everybody about Qadian, about Qadianis. Let's explain of how, of, because what happened, the villagers weren't going to the masjid. You know, now today, people, when there's talks in the masjid, we find a turnout, mashallah, but there's many people, the whole problem is, what I'm trying to indicate here is, well, if the deen and the religion stops coming out from the masajid, and it starts coming out from elsewhere, it's going to be a problem. It's going to be a very big problem. We have to make sure our youngsters are connected with the masajid. You know why? Because somebody will go on their YouTube, number one, he will put, Ahl Sunnah wal Jumaa, this, that, this, that, he will see what this person has to say, and then he will also see a small thing, what does this person have to say? And that person will change his mind again. What is the masajid? He will only get one view. And from the media, we'll get 10 views. So it's important that we keep our youngsters and everybody connected to the masajid also. So that they take the right information at all times. Going back to the point, Qadiyani, so they decided that, let's find, these people are not going to the masajid. So if they're not going to the masajid, let's try another way. 
What should we do? Let's, let's explain to them in a plain and simple way where everybody will turn up. What did they do? They started off a drama like a circus. And in the circus, what happened? Everybody came, the whole village came. Everybody's going to come to such places. Everybody came, the whole, the whole village came. And in this, and the issue of Qadiyazm at the time was, it was going very, it was, it was getting a bit complicated and the people were going into it. So they thought, let's, let's do this. This may be the way forward. So they done it. There's a light that comes out from the top of the stage, a very big light, which they try to implicate that it's the voice coming from the top. So a voice comes from the top and says, gather everybody. Gather everybody from beginning to end. So Adam alayhi salam, till the time of Nuh alayhi salam, they bring out all different people, all the messengers are there. And then the voice says, start taking the accounts. O oh, Nuh, O oh, Isa, O oh, Adam, did you tell your people to follow you and do these kind of things? They said, no Allah. Nuh alayhi salam said, no Allah, I did not tell my people. They betrayed me. Isa alayhi salam said, they betrayed me. I did not tell them. They betrayed me. And everybody asks for forgiveness. Now, Allah says, fine. It's time to weigh everybody's actions. So when this call is made, time to weigh everybody's actions, another man comes with his suit and his trousers and says, oh Allah, you're taking everybody's accounts, you forgot me. All the messengers are here, you forgot me. So the voice comes from above, who are you? So he goes, I'm Gulam Qadiani, Ahmad Mirza Qadiani. Allah says, Khabis, you liar, Kadhab, Dajjal, that's the noise that comes. Throw him in hell. As this judgment is being made, another person comes as a lawyer. Who is this? Iblis. He says, I thought there was justice in your kingdom. I thought there was justice here. I thought in your courts there's justice. You sent 124,000 and 124,000 you sent. I didn't say any, I didn't say anything. I only sent one and you decided to put him into the fire of hell. So everybody knew from that day that he was sent not by Allah, but he was sent by Iblis. He was sent by Shaitan. Very easy way of how to put it into people's thinking. But anyway, going back to the point, we learn how to make these du'as. Learn, ask for everyone, ask for everybody else, ask for the whole ummah, and we ask for ourselves, and make sure that the time that we have in these days, the last moments that we have in within the Ramadan, there's only 20 days, 10 or 10 days have gone. Let it not be that 10 days gone, another 10 gone, another 10 will go, and we're still exactly the same, the same position that we were 11 months ago. My brother, what difference is that going to make? It will make no difference on us at all. We've wasted the whole of Ramadan. And who knows? Who knows if we're going to get this Ramadan again next year or not. So make the use of it, out of it while we have it. You know, somebody was saying to me that the roses are so long. You know, roses are so long at the moment. But then he says, Alhamdulillah, don't worry. It's fine and everything. He, he just carried on and he said, everything's fine. It's okay. Then he just said one thing to me. But we, there's one thing that we have to make dua for. He said, who for? So he said, make dua for the people who have passed away. I go, why? So he goes, because when they were in this country, they kept all the small ones and they passed away and they left all the big ones for us. They left all the long ones for us. So it doesn't matter. You know, these long ones that we have now, the lungs that carry on with them, patience, the more it hits us and the more hard come it causes us, we should appreciate. We're getting more reward for it. And they make dua for the people that have passed because they're not here in Ramadan. Try to make, try to learn. They're not here. They cannot participate in the Ramadan. We've got one. Let's make a use of it before it runs out of our hands, before it comes out of our hands. And then we try to make use of it, but we won't have it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to act upon what has been said.